You're listening to Dramas Over Flowers with Saya, Anissa and Borima. This episode is brought to you by our lovely patrons. If you're a Sombe patron, please note that you now get an exclusive edition of some episodes like this one, where we leave in some controversial digressions and some silly ones. If you're a Mangle or a Hubei patron, please do check the Patreon page. We are creating some new content for you and we would love to get your feedback. To the rest of our listeners, please remember that we will be sending out the 2022 K-Drama Tracker to our entire mailing list on December 1st. It's completely free and by popular demand, we are releasing a Notion-compatible version along with the Excel Sheet one. So please, if you are not already signed up to our mailing list, use the link in the show notes to sign up today. And finally, this episode is also sponsored by the good folks at Rakuten Kobo who are giving our listeners a free 30-day trial to Kobo Plus. An all-you-can-read subscription to their catalogue of over 6 million e-books. No matter which genre you like, Kobo Plus will have a book you would want to add to your bookshelf right now. You can also access their library anywhere with a free Kobo app for iOS or Android or on any Kobo e-reader. Check out our show notes for the link and to see if the offer is available in your country. And now, on to the episode. Hey, I'm Saya. And I'm Parma. And we are doing a wide yak on... Well, it's on lots of things, but we're going to start <laughs> at Arsenal Military Academy and we are going to journey through Warrior School and a few other types of media that cover those things. Uh, that sounded really dry. It's going to be fun, especially if you read Tamara Pierce, which I believe is actually pronounced Tamara Pierce, but I learned that too late in life and I'm now stuck saying Tamara forever. Okay, but Saya, <laughs> you're, you're, not, you're, not, you're not telling them the most important thing. Chikai. Which is that we want to talk about Chikai, yeah. I thought that was your life. This is an episode primarily. <laughs> about how? <laughs> about Chikai. Yeah. <laughs> Like the moment I saw this boy, I was like, he needs to see this. <laughs> you, you don't know how proud I am of like completely, completely being right. <laughs> now, guys, I have to tell you how this all began. And really, it all began with me watching the first episode of Arsenal Military Academy and seeing Jukai for the first time. And then within five minutes, I think I sent my first text to Saya being like, you have to watch this. I had no idea how this drama was going to pan out, but I knew by the way they had dressed this boy, the way he carried himself, that this this was something that Saya could appreciate with me. There's something about this <laughs> type of character. And you know how I know? Queen's Thief. What's his name? <laughs> Jen. Jen. Eugenides. Eugenides. Yeah. That's that's how. I mean, we you might not be able to see a direct link, but in the Queen Steve series, there was this amazing character. He's the main character, basically. And it's Jen. Mm. It's Eugenides. And Saya and I obsessed <laughs> about that character. Now you've said it. <laughs> I didn't think of like Jen for a second, but now you've said it. I'm like, <laughs> oh, that is exactly and right. Because <laughs> I knew what our mindset was about Jen. I knew what it would be <laughs> about Jukai in Asura Military Academy. We should be very specific about that because after we finished watching this stuff, we have tried his other projects. Um, not all of them, a couple of them. And it's been a bit hit and miss. We'll get into all of that mm. stuff. But first, we should probably discuss Asura Military Academy. <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I think it's um, hilarious that... So here's the thing that our listeners should know. Like, we have a chat group, which is for us talking about the podcast. And what you may not know is that basically it's a forum of a continuous game of Convince Me to Watch. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever any of us is watching at that time, we make it our mission for like three solid weeks or three solid months to make everyone else watch that one thing that we are so obsessed with and we need someone else to join us. So yeah. this 
like Arsenal Military Academy is basically <laughs> one of your successful projects. You, you know, Barman, you're the one with the most successful projects. And I'm very jealous because I think I'm the one with the most failed projects. I'm like, oh, everyone, really? watch this. Please watch this murder show. Please watch that murder show. Please watch Bad Kids. Please watch Good Detective. Please watch Beyond Evil. Please watch something I'm watching. Please watch Watcher. None of them, neither Barman nor Anissa, fall prey to my convincing see that that's not true i started good detectives because of you and i got till about two thirds of it okay <laughs> and i will finish it someday i am watching bad kids right now you have to admit that is something you need time for and i'm not giving that up and and i am one episode away from finishing up crossfire what is <laughs> so you you have had successes and they've been very recent. <laughs> I'm acting like I'm I'm really upset about this, but I'm actually not. I do have a weird taste. Um, so basically, my life for the last, uh, well, for the whole of 2022 has really been following one recommendation from Borama after another. And <laughs> like, she guilt trips me. So she's like, please, for me, in her best wheedle. <laughs> And so, like, I was finishing up another drama that she had made me watch, which was um, uh, actually a Shukai drama, Falling Into Your Smile. We're going to talk more about that afterwards. Oh, no, we're not. This is why we're talking about this. <laughs> I'm just looking at, I'm looking at the rough plan I drew up. This is where we talk about Falling Into Your Smile. So I had followed up Crossfire with Falling Into Your Smile. And as you guys might know, if you've listened to the Crossfire episode... I really, really loved Crossfire. So I thought that was a successful sort of esports drama. Let me let me go for this other highly rated one, which has this name that I recognize because Warren has been hopping on about him for like ages. So, OK, <laughs> if not the other one, this one should be just as good. It's, it's also got this guy called Shukai in it. But it wasn't. I mean, I didn't love it. It was all right. I didn't love it and I didn't love him. So then I was highly skeptical when you were like, but you like him in Arsenal Military Academy. And I was like, but I've already seen him. Like, <laughs> there's just something about his character that doesn't fit right. It doesn't work. It doesn't come together. Um, I well, What I said was that that's because in Falling Into Your Smile, they made Jukai suppress everything that made him charismatic in Arsenal Military Academy. And I think they were really trying to make Jukai act like what Chinese contemporary dramas thinks a, a hero character should be, like a hero main lead should be, very serious and, and very stoic. Like a, a, a straight man, yeah. stoic, what what another character in Arsenal Military Academy is, like his oh, direct, yes. yeah. you know opponent yeah. in love so to speak <laughs> um and that's what they were trying to make Jukai be and I really don't think he should go down that path he's he he doesn't naturally have that gravitas and while he did okay I honestly like I enjoyed falling into your smile to be perfectly honest but that wasn't because of Jukai it, it was because of the actress involved uh Cheng Xiao who played Tong Yao and I wouldn't say she's, she was the best actress, but for that character, she was surprisingly a good fit. And I just really liked the story because it focused so much on her and I suppose her relationship with the team and also what mentorship Jukai's character, who was the team leader, gave her. I thought all of that stuff played out really well. It was very, you know, calm, chill sort of a drama. Didn't have like mm. high dramatic moments. But the story as a whole appealed to me. But Jukai didn't. And mm. I was disappointed because I started watching it because of Jukai. <laughs> and of course, so when you said that instead of watching Arsenal Academy first, you decided to watch this first. I was like, no, you're going to <laughs> miss out on what makes him amazing. <laughs> but thankfully, then you went. Why Why did you start watching Arsenal Military Academy though? Like, I think was my wheeling that convincing? It genuinely was. I, You know, I'm very easily sort of guilt tripped into watching things. So I was like, <laughs> because you said for me. And, and then I was like, oh. <laughs> like, I can't say no. Basically, I'm that that terrible person who can't say no. And so... If I had said, like, I was going to, then I would. So I did. Aww. And then I met him in the first episode and he was dreadful. And then, He was. 
but, you know, like sometimes you're just like you you're in that space where something is terrible and you carry on watching it mm. just because it's easier to carry on watching than it is to sort of use the energy to decide to not watch it. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> Actually, yeah. No, no, no. I, I, I know what you mean, but I don't think it's usually that you would keep watching it even if it was... So here, th- there are two way, two two levels to this. On on the one hand, something might be terrible and like really trigger you, in which case you would immediately stop watching mm. it. On the other hand, something might be terrible objectively. You know it's terrible, but you're waiting for it to get better. There is something about yeah. it that it's yeah that that makes you kind of curious. Does it get better? <laughs> I mean, in fairness, it was interesting enough, the storyline. And we haven't said what the storyline is yet. So, I mean, let's briefly do that. Um, yeah, because absolutely. the drama itself actually has a lot more going on than Shukai, though. Oh, you know. oh, yeah. And, and that is, to be honest, the reason I could sit through the first episode. Because the premise started, like, it, it didn't have, like, a backstory or anything. Mm. It started from go. Yeah. Um, so... Do you want to do it? You, you sure. do the, uh, yeah. <laughs> so primarily it's a gender bender. You have uh, a young woman, uh, Xie Sheng, who is played by Bai Lu, who enlists for military school in place of her brother who died. Uh, she's from Beijing. She She's from Beijing. I don't know why I had to pronounce that like it was French. She's <laughs> she's from Beijing and she she goes to a completely different city where the academy is to join and she has her boy disguise on. So she cuts her hair, she's wearing boy clothes, and she goes to sign up. You know, one of the interesting things that the drama never answers is how she passed that first medical. <laughs> yeah, they completely I kind of assume that she must have, like, bribed the guy. Because, yeah. I mean, she couldn't figure out how to pass it again the second time. Yeah. A- and a lot of shenanigans were involved to, like, yeah. kind of get her through it. I thought she might have found a nurse who helped her fiddle the paperwork. I feel like a woman might have been more sympathetic. I wish they had shown it, though. I It's like they left it to your imagination because they couldn't figure out a clever enough yeah. thing. <laughs> It was just like one of those, what is the, there's a word for it, but I can't remember what it is, where they just like, the story did it, it happened. That's all you need to know. (laughs) We are not going to expend any energy on saying how it happened. (laughs) So the show is set in the era just post the 1911 revolution, um, which overthrew the Qing dynasty. If I haven't pronounced that wrong, and I may have, I apologize. Um which was the last imperial dynasty of China. And that sort of begins the era of um, China as a republic. And so they have a lot of political turmoil at the time. So you have like American and um, British political and military interference. And and Japanese and Russian. Russian. It's a spot uh, of many sort of world powers kind of coming in and doing things. So mm. yeah, it's a it's a very unstable period of the republic, and basically everything I know about the period is from the drama, <laughs> and a skim of the Wikipedia page. <laughs> Initially, that was true. That was true of me too. Also, I had read something about that period a while back and then completely forgotten everything. Mm -hmm. And then while watching the drama, because they made references to certain revolts, certain like the student revolution of the time and several other things. And things started coming back to me again. And one thing that I really enjoy is simply the the sense of turmoil in the period that that the drama created. Mm -hmm. I mean... In a way, it's it's fantastical and it's silly and it's funny and it's romantic and it's all of that. It's also but there very is serious. like an underlying. Mm. It's also very serious because the times were very serious and it was if you weren't rich, if you happened to be a commoner, if you, I mean, best of luck to you to mm. living till the next day. Yeah. It's really hard period. And that's not surprising because most new republics often tend to really struggle because there are always parties with their own interests, you know, Mm -hmm. from stronger countries that are hovering around to exploit your resources. And that's exactly what was happening. There was a land grab of sorts uh, by trading powers all over China. And China's government was, as the characters keep saying repeatedly, weak in that they couldn't enforce their own laws. Mm -hmm. The privileges of you know all of the trading 
powers. Like the Japanese had their own laws. Like their people could only be tried by them and stuff like that. Um, were kind of they superseded. China's own laws mm -hmm. and what that often created was a situation where the businesses of Chinese uh, origin couldn't really compete with these trading powers and anytime they got big enough these people I mean you, basically you can imagine a situation where the country's own people weren't allowed to thrive because that would go against the interest of the mm -hmm. foreign powers who were trading on yeah. the soil and they were also actively fighting wars on Chinese soil that didn't even technically involve China it was just trade wars happening by foreign powers on Chinese soil mm -hmm. it was a bizarre period yeah and at the same time it wasn't an all-out occupation either but it had a lot of these sort of colonial... No, it wasn't. Technically, this was an independent country. Mm. Just one that couldn't protect its own interests. Right. And I think the, the drama makes a good case of showing that, mm -hmm. that, that how helpless these people felt, which is entirely why um, a drama like this, like having something like the Arsenal Military Academy exist, even in fiction, is kind of... It's a bit like rewriting history because an elite... Uh, military academy for officers these kind of things actually did exist at the time but they were not these super powered kids <laughs> it's not this is a bit of a fantasy mm -hmm. um, but it it's a good way to relive history where you are giving like the Chinese people are giving themselves a little more power than they actually had mm -hmm. um it's a lot like like when we look back at the freedom struggle and we envision our freedom fighters to be Characters from that movie, uh, RRR, that suddenly has internationally become so popular and I still haven't finished watching <laughs> it. <laughs> um, they, they are just like superhuman, even though technically we were really, really in, a, in an oppressed and like weakened position. Mm. Um, anyway, I've gone on for really yeah, long. Sorry, I, go on. I find that actually an interesting perspective because as a sort of British person, our experience of our history, although the British Isles did experience a lot of occupation from sort of Roman era uh, up to medieval kind of, you know, those times. That's very sort of not modern at all. Mm. So the modern history of the British Isles has been one of imperialism, colonialism, pillage <laughs> and genocide. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting to watch a show that is okay how do i put this like china as a present superpower and how like the purpose a drama like this serves in terms of propaganda is curious to me like do you how do you look back at that time and is there a reason for doing that or is it pure storytelling i i agree with what you're saying or rather i see what you're saying china right now is no longer in the position that it was in the early 20th century mm -hmm. right now it's if anything overpowered yeah. <laughs> and its influence is felt harshly by its neighbors and also in other countries across the mm -hmm. world especially as chinese business business interests have started affecting politics of uh, different countries sri lanka for instance or you know pakistan um but without going very deep into geopolitics when you have the writers sitting in a very powerful country looking back at a time when your country was weak and the people felt weak and you thirsted for military strength because you saw other countries with stronger militaries occupying your territory and cause the deaths of your people mm. the the reaction is always to like want military strength to fight back yeah and it's used to stoke a sense of nationalism and i think as someone who is very sort of anti-nationalist generally i find that difficult to come to terms with even as much as i can appreciate the historical context yeah I can completely understand that. Like even sitting in a different country and definitely in a different era, when I see these characters in Asometry Academy looking helplessly at situations unfolding that they cannot stop because they don't have the strength of like having the police uh, back them up or like just, just you know, the, the political social strength mm -hmm. to like stop it from happening. 
I feel bad for them. Yeah. I want them empowered. Yeah. And you root for them. I root I root for them. Of course, these characters in history, even if they mm. are uh, fictitious, <laughs> still the people like them yeah. existed in that situation. But like, so where is the line between this feeling of like sympathy mm. because you understand and then being a modern Chinese viewer looking at this situation and then looking at your current neighbors whom you have border disputes with and being like, well, you had oppressed us, yeah. you know, 70 years back and, you know, we will show you how strong we are today. And like, yeah. I just want to also add here that I'm not saying that every viewer is that gullible. I'm saying that sometimes when you don't think of what you're consuming with as much over analysis as we do, <laughs> um, you end up with like these thoughts in the back of your mind that you may not be aware of because you mm. simply haven't haven't pulled it out and 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 thought about it a little more and a perfectly normal thing to take away from such a story is that they oppressed us for so long and you know and therefore today we will show you how strong we are mm. that is the kind of uh, narrative that is often used in my country especially in stories where you have like, I'm sorry, but like the British um, or <laughs> even Americans. Yeah. I mean, and, it's kind of what I mean about like, uh, the British not having an underdog past to invoke that is recent enough yeah. to give you that kind of feeling. Like the British have not been underdogs for like a thousand years at all. It's just, you know, there's nothing to invoke that. Yeah, which, which is why I don't really feel bad for them. Like when my my when when my country's movies, movie yeah. industries are like British people bad. Oh no, I like Let that. Let the tigers at them. <laughs> One of the things I really felt when I was watching this show is that it's you know how people have like this dark academia thing and I'm not really there, but I have a warrior school fantasy thing. So like that is my <laughs> genre. Okay. Um, and if any of our listeners have um, read, oh, do I say tomorrow? Do I say Tamara? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if any of our listeners have read any Tamara piece, which I feel very weird saying, cause I'm used to saying tomorrow. <laughs> um, <laughs> The the one that really came to mind for me as I was watching this was the Protector of the Small series that she wrote um, about um, Keladri of Mindelin. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that name right either. <laughs> Who goes to a night school to train to be a knight. Um, and she's the first girl to be accepted on the, the, the program. They didn't call it a program. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like... You know, there's like there are these rites of passage. The way that that story is structured, there's this sort of th this period of like intense physical training of having an all male um, set of peers, of being the girl, you know, whether they know it or not. And interestingly, um, Tamara Pierce actually has two series that are about a girl who becomes a knight. And the first one is you might think is the natural comparison for this, the Alana series, um, the um, Lioness Quartet. Because that was a gender bender. Yeah, because she had to disguise herself as a boy to become a student at the school. But actually, the beats of the story are not... That was more sort of magic and intrigue, whereas this one, the Kel story, is more about the daily work of being you know, a student in that school, you're going through this physical training, you're going through the processes of making friends and growing your friendships and finding people mm. to rely on. And like there's yeah, this and whole... Pierce's writing was more mature by the time she did um, Kiladri because I remember that Alana, like everything was too easy because she was magically gifted. So yeah. she learned everything really fast yeah. <laughs> and everybody was like oh my god you're amazing and very little training was actually involved yeah exactly um and the story focused primarily on the on the fact that she had to hide her gender for mm. a period of time and the transition from her own society to the society that she mm. enters once she realizes her powers and, and stuff. her best friends and allies were the like you know one of them is the person who is the king in the Kell books. Mm, yeah. So like the so whole very, very thing. Privileged. Yeah, very different. Whereas the Kell yeah. books, they're just, they're actually much, I mean, they're still nobles, but they're ordinary nobles. Yeah. 
Like they're not And also something something you gotta really like is that the Lana series happens in the same world, but like about what, a thousand years before or something? No, 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 they're the same generation. I mean, because Alana, like the Alana generation is kind of parent age to Kel's generation. Oh, okay. So I thought there was like a vast difference. No, but no, you're no. okay. Yeah. Wow. But I remember that magic was no longer used, or magic was not that prevalent anymore mm, it, during Kalari's. No, or maybe she was, was not gifted in magic. She, yeah, maybe, she's maybe not that magical. Was the thing. Yeah, and that's what made okay. her a little bit different because she's actually the sort of physically athletic girl. She's strong. She's big. She's the opposite of Alana in every way, basically. And she's not magical at yeah. all. So she had to do it all on her own skill. And so when you're doing this coming of age as warriors, it's not the same as sort of an individual coming of age story because the process of growth that you you go through, you go through as a collective, you go through as a group. And when you come of age as a group, it's the the purposes and the goals are different because like you have this sort of a unity of purpose. You have a very specific Mm. goal that you're going for. In the case of uh, Arsenal Military Academy, their goal was to serve their country, to sort of turn away the, you know, um, not invaders, but like to turn away these foreign interests who were trying to sort of destroy their country from within. Mm. And like similarly, if you go to Huarang, which is the other sort of natural comparison I would make for Arsenal Military Academy, is... Again, these boys are are going through this process of warrior school to defend their country against, um, you know, um, foreign encroachment, to protect the king who is the, what is it? The faceless king. There you go. (laughs) To protect (laughs) the faceless king. Um, They had to create an environment of safety for basically their values to thrive and flourish. And so it's like this very sort of belief and value-based growth, which you're expecting when you go through these collective experiences of training, of being together. And you're like together every hour of the day. Like you don't get a Mm. break from each other. You may have like people you sort of don't get on with who are your enemies. But at the end of the day, you have to find a way to no longer be at cross purposes with them because you do ultimately all have the same end goal. And yeah. so the Kel story addresses that, the Huarang story addresses that, and uh, uh, Arsenal Military Academy addresses that. And I think um, Arsenal does it really in a actually very beautiful way. They take 48,000 episodes to do it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it is like the goal with a show like this is to sort of make it heart bursty. And it does it. Mm. And, and that's kind of like, I can't, I, I'm... I sound like I'm very calm and sane when I'm talking about this, but I'm actually not calm and sane at all (laughs) because I sit there watching them with my heart bleeding, my face bleeding with like tears and just being like, oh, (laughs) I love you all so much. No, how dare you die? You know, all sorts of, you just become very, very attached to them as a group because you're going through that Mm. process with them. And yeah, yeah. I really liked it. I, I I think the show did a good job of showing how the characters developed affection for each other. Mm. Um, and as their relationships deepened, you liked the characters more and more. Right. And something, um, a mistake that a lot of, um, and I'm going to just specifically talk about Chinese dramas here, uh, Chinese historicals do, when they do like these, you know, romance-focused historicals, where the romance is a big part of the plot is that they just focus on the main characters and maybe, you know, the secondary love interests. But aside from that, the rest of the characters become sort of just cardboard and they are just there, chess pieces to be moved when the plot needs to be moved. Mm -hmm. And the romance becomes like the be-all and end-all. The plot moves because, you know, you need to do something with these people while they're not romancing. (laughs) But that's, that's not how they did Arsenal Military Academy at all. Like, there is a, a background plot of romance building, but the actual plot is really about forming this brotherhood, mm-hmm. about this older generation of uh, people who have been disillusioned with, you know, the Republic because it's not what they had hoped for. 
And so they created this military academy full of the uh, sons Hmm. slash oh, daughters yes. <laughs> the one daughter yeah. of um, you know r- relatively well high class off people people yeah. exactly and the reason it was done is because they wanted uh, kids of well off family who are educated and have some power leading their army it was the same reason why officers usually tended to come from this Upper class of society yeah. so to speak yeah uh, both because they have power, they can like that. That means that their parents' interests are also engaged, um, but also that they are educated, they are trained in strategy. It's another way of creating class within the military, mm-hmm. um, and that's what they were doing. But also, of course, in this particular situation, they just wanted good officers to head their army. They didn't really have any, and they kept losing um, parts of their army because they were sent off to support a Japanese war or a, or a Russian war or an American war. And like they kept losing parts of their army. So what they wanted was like officers who are loyal to the Chinese government first. And you couldn't just like gather this group of people and be like, be loyal to just China and mm-hmm. not to the interests of whoever your parents are serving. So instead what they did was they put these kids through mission after mission, which by the way, who sends students <laughs> of a school to missions where things are get, like there are bombs going off and mm. people are getting shot and like stabbed and it's just this does not seem but like I also, <laughs> I also feel like that sort of gives you a sense of how dangerous the time was I mean yes that that's why I was okay with it but on the <laughs> other hand part of me was like this is a mission <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Go rescue something from somewhere like a warehouse full of like people with dangerous ammunition. They were meant to be low risk though. And also the other thing is that they were actually treated as an auxiliary arm of yeah, they were, like, they a, were, a military yeah. resource. They were ready to go, you know, at the point that they had sort of received enough training. If there mm. was something, you know, where their skills were needed, then they would have to be deployed, right? Absolutely. So it wasn't that they were willy-nilly being sent around the countryside (laughs) to be killed. It was just a matter of that's how short resourced they were. And at times they would have to be deployed because there was no one else. Absolutely. I I don't know why I'm making justifications for this. (laughs) No, 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 I I appreciate that because... Sometimes I get stuck on a point and I I forget the rest of the context. Um, And you also get to see their development as soldiers individually and as a group. Mm. Um, Because when they are first brought, I really like that scene where the first day of military school (laughs) and all of these characters are meeting each other and like cliques are forming and group dynamics are being established. Um, for instance, like one of the characters is uh, oh, yeah. Junshan, Shen Junshan. And he's one of those guys who comes from a really rich family. He has a defined understanding of good and bad. But like when he's seeing bullying happening in front of him, he does not willingly intercede and like break them up. The only reason he got involved was because um, Bailu's character... Uh, who's basically taken on the identity of her brother and is Liang Chen for most of the drama, mm-hmm. um, she intercedes and things get very chaotic and then he steps in. And this is a good introduction to his character because you see him do this thing and you have already got like a good grasp of the kind of person he's going to be. Mm. He's quite firm with like where the rules are and how he's going to abide by them. And he doesn't really like disorderly behavior. All of this stuff starts becoming very apparent from the get-go. And Bailu's character is also pretty standard heroine in that she will not, you know, tolerate an injustice Mm. and will dive into stopping bullies and all of that stuff. But what you gotta like about her character is that she's very straightforward, like her, like, Liang Chen's character is very straightforward, but she's not stupid. Mm. So she can be wary and and she has a quick wit and she has a pretty decent smart mouth. (laughs) So like while she's not the most riveting character on the field immediately, she also has an established character in that first scene. And then you have Zhu Kai's character come in. Like, drunk off his head <laughs> on the first day of school. <laughs> and, 
and you think that this is going to go in a certain way where this you know drunk swaggering rich boy comes in and this is going to just be his established character but where the drama impresses you is that the person in charge of this group of miscreants will not take any of that so you think that this guy a uh, drunk rich boy swaggering he's just going to walk in here and like that's going to be his established character but no something happens and the drama takes you by surprise right off the bat and <laughs> then our story gets going the point is that you know individual characters as well as group dynamics are established really quickly which is why it's so easy to just keep watching this drama episode after episode mm. even though it feels like this is way too many episodes <laughs> for this story it, it is way too many episodes but it doesn't feel like way too many episodes and i think so this is the thing to know whenever you watch something that is this long is you're not signing up for a single story you're not signing up for like that one arc here's a case it begins here and ends here and then there's a little bit of a you know a sort of a wind down like it's not one story that is neat and self-contained it's kind of this epic sprawling saga but it's also an experience because at at a point you're not there for the story anymore you're there for the experience of being with these people even if the story fails you in some ways even if it's got plot holes even if it's got a couple of filler draggy episodes or whatever uh, or like there's that one character who really annoys you because they just won't die um <laughs> or even if you're laughing at the hilarious and insane body count because just people are dying left and right in this drama it's like a f- video game sometimes There's in just... really dumb ways <laughs> but i mean just like the general body count <clears throat> yeah that's you know, true that's true like the and they're just leaving and... them on the street yeah right like, they shot like a bunch of people in an alleyway and then nobody seems to end like, after they're, them they're like... just like wood lice they just come out of the woodwork <laughs> and they just they drop like flies that was a lot of strange mixed bug metaphors um, but like you you don't care like after a point yeah. it doesn't really matter because you're there for the experience of being there not to sort of sit mm. there critically analyzing the story that's true but also the fight scenes are just choreographed really really well mm. especially with the sword uh, the sword and and like the knife fight scenes mm. and even like the hand to hand combat it's done really well and like if you watch enough chinese drama fantasy historicals there are lots of like sword fights that look beautiful and with like swishy garments going in this direction <laughs> that direction but this in like those fitted uniform to oh, be man, handling those, those swords it so you good. had to have like the grace of a freaking ballerina to for that to look amazing and all of the actors seem to be able to carry that yeah. off. I mean, like I think I was frantically texting you in the first few episodes like what is this 16th century vampire look? Cuz like <laughs> Shikai is wearing these leather pants and like I I don't say pants, I say oh. trousers, but like when it, when they're leather you have to say leather pants. He's wearing <laughs> these like leather pants and these long swishing coats with all the buttons oh. and the collars and you're just like whoa this is a really nice aesthetic and also nice just aesthetic. like that 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 bang that goes just oh, in that this flop, one yes. side hiding his his one eye yeah. somewhat and like how his like uh, i think the part over his right ear is kind of just you know a bit like so razored sh- off yeah. yeah and oh my god that look is sharp yeah i mean you know sharp. what you reminded me of <laughs> and i i oh. don't like to use this comparison because i don't like this guy now but like leonardo dicaprio I think sort of circa 1994 no i know i know i know what exactly you know, what that you're kind of romeo about, yeah. and juliet era that look yes. where he was all floppy hair and like mm-hmm, you know mm-hmm, bones and all of that yeah so <laughs> yeah <laughs> but but yeah exactly that where yeah. he's almost like a doll with like big eyes drawn on and stuff almost like an anime it's just character so but badass. human and you're like uh, and the badassness yeah. of this is just like so satisfying uh, and one other thing that is i just wanted to sort of tack on to what you were saying about the group dynamics is it's so satisfying to see those sort of disparate um groups of students and the cliques and all of these things actually like part of their growth is that like 
those differences are obliterated by the things that they mm. go through. Yeah, absolutely. And because what they experience as the show goes on, especially like in the so the end run of the show, some of those things are so severe. Some of those things are so deep and so sort of like aggrieving that you can't hold on to like the pettiness of your school days, right? So this is, again, one of the things that I really love about this style of story and you know the the books that I was talking about the Tamara Pierce books they have this as well particularly in the Kel series mm. is that the beginning of the story is very everyday it's about your daily school life it's about the sort of petty differences you have with your classmates but the end of the story is about you coming into the fullness of your adulthood and like the the soft things have been sort of shaven away by hardship, by grief, by loss, by sorrow, by war, by the things that you have experienced in that time, that the little things that you had different, like the differences that you had between you don't matter anymore because you've, mm. you know, you've seen the Kraken. That, that's what they call it in, in the <laughs> Kell books. Like going to war is seeing the Kraken. These kids have mm. seen the Kraken now and that gives them something that unifies them in a deep, deep way that makes those little outer things just not matter anymore. True. And I think that's particularly beautiful as you see a couple of the enmities resolve. Like in Arsenal Academy, there's a few very notable enmities from the start of the show that by the end of the show, you are actually crying for these characters. <sighs> yeah. I'm sad now. <laughs> <laughs> but let us not go to sad things. Let us go to... I think actually this is a good point to talk about the Vincenzo problem. Um, and I don't know yeah. if you know what I mean by the Vincenzo problem, but... I, I have no idea. <laughs> I really wanted to ask you. <laughs> the Vincenzo problem is... You guys actually talked about this in a yak that I ha uh, didn't manage to join that time when you talked about how you reconcile a hero who kills people. I actually don't remember ah. the content of that conversation right now, but I do remember like Anissa made some really excellent points. Um, and I was going to listen to it before I came to this, but I didn't have time. But this is the Vincenzo problem, is are your heroes still heroes if they have killed people? And in this show, everyone kills a lot and very indiscriminately. Okay, it's not indiscriminate. <laughs> it's not indiscriminate, but it's very a lot. Um, I mean, indiscriminate towards their enemies, definitely. At, um, at one point, I started wondering if they hadn't turned the enemy mm. into this like this one homogenous thing mm. where they need to all be cut down without question mm. because even though there were moments where certain people like a doctor here or you know a, a character there were from like from the Japanese side because they were the primary enemies in uh, this mm. story um, were shown to be sympathetic or yeah. at least not wholly bad mostly the cadets of the academy were cutting down people who were just remotely in their way in any of their mission right. without really paying much attention to like it's it's basically they are all cannon fodder in front of right. them yeah yeah i mean this is actually the reason why i couldn't tell from the very beginning whether the the shen brothers um there's jin shen and there's his older brother ting bai yeah i actually thought they were meant to be villains because we basically we too. meet Shen Tingbei as a like you know like a mob boss type of guy like he just yeah. he killed this guy on the ground and just, like it looked very sort of mafioso you know that kind of style mm. and you're like okay they're the villains and then you have like uh, one of the secondary female characters who is turning this guy down because she's like do you know how many people he's killed and mm. so I thought oh okay so these guys are like hmm be careful around them they are probably. Yeah you know, the enemy. Um, so this is, this is Zhu Man Ting, right? Zhu Man Ting, um, yeah. The secondary right. female character, yeah. whom I love, by the way. She's so great. I just want her name. <laughs> we will talk about her a bit more later. Okay. So, so this is what this drama does, is actually you have to reshuffle how you perceive the drama. Because if you're coming into it with your kind of 2022 mentality of, you know, every death is very significant and important and has to be justified like you know if a hero kills someone there has to be a really good reason mm. the problem you know with the show is the body count they're, they're just everybody's <laughs> killing everyone but also there was a, a another point where I was extremely troubled um which is and, and I wondered if this is why you told me to stop watching it, episode 33 because it's in episode 34 that they go on this sort of assassination mission. Uh, this is a spoiler mm -hmm. 
But um, for the show, warning. <laughs> I should, probably should have put the spoiler warning in before. <laughs> um, so the, the kids are sent on an assassination mission where they basically, they just go and assassinate people. Like, they just kill them. And that's it. And uh, you see, this is like, in any other story, that wouldn't be the hero. That would be the anti-hero, which is, I guess, the sort of answer to the Vincenzo problem is that that person can no longer be a hero. Right? Like, mm. you cross the line. When you cross the line of taking and a of life... And of course, with Vincenzo, he, like, the story was aware of it, mm. and Vincenzo owned that. Yeah. Like, that he is not the hero. Exactly. That he can never be the hero, and because the hero will not be willing to do certain things... Right. And, and he will, so he's okay with yeah. not being the hero. I yeah. mean, that was like a whole thing. <laughs> there were like memorable dialogues involved. There, it was, and it was great because they really addressed it in such a detailed and thorough way. And the problem, the conflict in Vincenzo isn't in the character, it's in the viewer because you're watching Song Joong-hi mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. you're like, but it's Song Joong-hi and he should be the hero. And so you, like, it's actually very clever of the show to force you to confront what like your own implicit biases like towards somebody like Sung Jung be like you know I'm not gonna think badly of him how can I he's whom he is but then the show is like no you you need to choose between your morality and your Sung Jung okay and <laughs> you do right yeah. and the show helps you the show doesn't sort of leave you high and dry with that problem mm. it, because then most it people gives would choose you a Sung problem Jung-ki. and then it gives you a solution <laughs> <laughs> this is what's concerning and that's I I guess this is what I'm saying about this show is that it gives you that problem, but it doesn't view it as a problem. So therefore, it can't give you a solution. But then at the same time, you're also like, but it's war. You know, you have to, you have to just be critical by yourself. Like you have to ask your own questions and then answer them yourself. (laughs) (laughs) The the difference between something like Vincenzo and um, Arsenal Military Academy is that these are cadets and they have been trained to do things as they are asked to by their superiors. Because soldiers now, take orders, are, that's the point. Exactly. The entire point of them being soldiers is that they take orders. But there is also something else that's built into the story, which I really like, is that these aren't just soldiers. These are officers. Mm. Officers don't just take orders. They make their own decisions. So there are times when they question oh, that's um, true. their teachers. And they revolt. And, yeah. And they revolt. And it was more than once, in fact, actually. They definitely yeah, had at least three points where they revolted against their orders. That's true. And eventually, like, through this process of questioning and revolting and, like, being punished and, like, learning what's right and whom to trust, they form a sort of a internal hierarchy within the school where they trust certain teachers and not others. Mm. Um, and the thing is, the mission they are sent to, by the way, was not given to them by the teacher that they trusted Mm. it was more like a negotiation do you want to get out of like because they were being punished for certain something that they had done Mm. do you want to get out of this cell do you want to like do something good while you're at it then go on this mission because the teacher they trusted was again sending them first of all because these are young cadets they are still in school they are not fully formed soldiers Mm. yet but also because that teacher knew that this was more or less a suicide mission. Yeah. The police had been trying to do this, like assassinate these people or, or arrest them for a long time and repeatedly feeling, what could this small group of kids do? And, and the way the mission was formulated was so that the academy didn't have to take any responsibility if they got caught. Right. So again, these are not just soldiers taking orders. This is a negotiated situation where it's been filled in their head that you're going in there with glorious purpose because these are very evil, very bad people. But also they have been put in the position where they have to execute this because they are in a situation where they are they're basically... In, in jail within the academy and they mm. have to get out of there. Yeah. So it's it's a it's a situation where they are not just being asked to get out of bed in the morning and ordered to go on a mission, you know, the next yeah. day. Um, so I don't know if I made any point <laughs> while rambling through all of that. I suppose what I'm trying to say is that they know how to question orders, but they were in a situation where questioning wasn't really possible. Mm. But also that it had been filled into their heads that the people you're going up against mm. are people you hate. Yeah. You hate these foreigners with too much power over our land. Mm. And this is your opportunity to both gain your freedom and to do good for your country. And so then they send the kids. And I think in fairness, it was 
like this order that they were given was shown to be dodgy like it wasn't absolutely meant. because because the the good teacher questions it he's like you what you're doing is not right these kids are most likely going to come back dead hmm. and you're washing your hands off any hmm. responsibility and that he too that teacher too had been under pressure absolutely uh, and that's why he sort of saw himself as being forced into doing it Because I mean I I don't want to say that that teacher was all out bad because I think they no were no he too. wasn't he he but in that was moment he made a, authority right he made a dis- he didn't he sort of passed the buck basically mm, um yeah. in in a way to be, be free of consequences um the uh, the other thing that I wanted to remark on and this comes up a lot in K dramas of course um is I was really struck in the show about like the role of of students student protests student revolutions. Yeah. And you know, it's it's interesting sort of from a history and politics kind of point of view and I don't oh, know a lot about Oh my things. god. Go on. So, do you remember that while we were because you asked me just a couple of days back what was the drama where I had sent you a chat many months back <laughs> about how sometimes Chinese dramas, especially historical Chinese dramas, put in dialogues and like scenes and situations where they're directly talking to the current government and their behavior but uh-huh. they do it in a historical context where it seems like they're talking to somebody else this was it oh it was this one i thought it, it, it was the student been. like the yeah. student protest situation what one of the characters said very clearly because the students were made into villains for protesting mm-hmm. and I I forget the exact quote but this was a a tremendously impactful scene where one of the students was basically like how can a country not have enough confidence or strength in itself to allow its students to raise their voice and ask questions because they were just being imprisoned for asking questions mm. And this was a dialogue in this drama by a student oh, protester. I had a feeling. And I wasn't sure if this was the drama you meant <sighs> and that's why because it was it was a really long time ago that you said it. Yeah. By really long time I mean like maybe 6 months ago. <laughs> <laughs> But as we know, even a week is a really long time for me. But uh, and for me uh, <laughs> and the, and the reason I randomly brought this up while you were talking about student protest is because so I asked me just last week what was the drama yeah. <laughs> that you said this about and I was like, "Huh, oh, what could it be?" <laughs> I could <laughs> I'm glad we solved Sorry, that okay, mystery. Okay, go on, go on, go on. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's I just that's all I wanted to say about that. I mean, I'm not particularly knowledgeable in these things, but I know, for example, like you know, in the Guangzhou uprising in Korea, the democratization movement, all of those things were student led. Oh, also, I I just realized that pre, like a few minutes ago when we were talking about student protests, we were talking about civilian students protesting in this era in mm-hmm. within the show, but. our main characters are also all students mm. and they also frequently like we said revolt against yeah. the academy um people in power that they don't agree with so you have the show implicitly and explicitly showing repeatedly that these feats of idealism have merit and that people in the government should have enough courage to let them have a voice mm-hmm. instead of trying to put them in jail or just shoot them dead yeah so and that idealism has its place as well because how do you yeah. build a better nation how do you build a better society how do you build like a better belief in in the systems if you are not starting from a point of idealism right yeah and that's what the students can do because they haven't been jaded yet they can start at the point of idealism and and you know uh, let's not be grim <laughs> I'll, i'll leave that sentence where it ended starting at the point of idealism okay and then you know up all the way or down all the way who knows <laughs> uh i guess let's talk about the gender uh, bend next um which yes, actually you let, think we would have started with but the drama was has such other like big stuff in it that we are actually more The synopsis of the drama was a sleight of hand. Like it, the synopsis says that the character of um Shi Chang gets into the military academy, pretends to be her brother, and that's where she meets um other soldiers and um uh, and Jukai <laughs> <laughs> as uh, Gu Yanchen. And that is what the story is supposed to be. But so it's kind of like hey, more like early 20th century Mulan uh is is how 
initially I thought this was going to go. And then the story is not about that at all. I mean, it's there. It's it's definitely one of the plot beats, but there are like 19 plots happening simultaneously. <laughs> yeah. Each of these characters have like backgrounds. They have families. And you you get to know so many of them and their stories and, and also what's happening with the government, what's happening with like the old imperial family. How are they interfering with <laughs> things that are happening and uh, maybe trying to get power back? Like I said, 19 different plots. And uh, there is an advantage and a disadvantage to this. The advantage of this kind of ensemble storytelling is that it's really interesting. If one plot beat slows down, there are others to like pick up and push the series forward. And thankfully, the writer did a good enough job that like majority of these plot beats were really interesting to watch. And these people were very interesting to get to know. The disadvantage is that Bailu's character, Shi Chang, didn't actually, I, I don't think she got the development that would have made her character very memorable. Like there are other characters who ended up being far more memorable than the technical main lead of the drama. Mm -hmm. Like she was impressive. Like uh, she had charisma and she had great dialogues and great moments with other characters. But in terms of character arcs, I think she was shortchanged. Yeah, I I think that she definitely wasn't expected to carry the show alone. But yeah, I was actually kind of shocked when you pointed this out to me the other day because I did not notice while I was watching the show, that she does not get a lot or any character development. Because, I mean, I guess, one, they use her personality in place of character development. That's really And her personality true. is actually really fun. It's a good personality. Yeah. Her character is built very well. And perhaps mm. maybe what we're saying is that they created a character that didn't really need to develop because she didn't really have flaws. In I mean, she was not a perfect person, but she wasn't Kuyenjin. She didn't need to come back from being that swaggering. Didn't drunk need to boy. be redeemed in any way. Exactly. The the thing is that in terms of character development, as soon as she changed from her feminine clothes to her, you know, what her brother would have worn, the military mm-hmm. clothes, and and like sheared off her hair and entered the military grounds the first day. That's it. Her her character development was done. Yeah, her they're, transformation they're, was complete. Yeah, and, and they literally her character from that day to the absolute last day. Like she becomes more um, physically adept because mm. she works really hard. But all of these stuff, like these character qualities of of like determination and bravery in the face of incredible odds, um, and persistence, all of those things are already built into her character. Mm -hmm. She starts with them. She doesn't develop them. Yeah. So even in the last episode, she's exactly the same girl that she was on the first day of Mm -hmm. uh, of the military academy. But what, like the only arc that she has is that she gets into military school, she becomes more skillful, and um, eventually she falls in love. Mm. Honestly, I can't think of another thing that changed for her (laughs) in terms of like, However, however, the kind of character she was, was, you know how gender benders always do this thing where the show really wants you to remember she's a girl. By the way, she's a girl. Like they're constantly highlighting she's a girl, either with the characters treating her that way, like the king's affection, for God's sake. God, (laughs) that drama. Thank you, Puck and Bin, for doing a different drama. Anyway, <laughs> we're talking about uh, extraordinary Tony Wu being amazing right now. Um, but yeah, so like, Shi Sheng was this character who fully inhabited her male identity. Like, mm, yeah, absolutely. she wasn't vacillating between, oh, do I act girly or am I give you know, like she wouldn't, she wasn't giving herself away. She just, she became mm. the char- the boy that she wanted to be. And she was mm. very committed to her mission. Like she she went into that school with a goal, which was to become, mm. you know, to complete the training and become the soldier. And so, and that's why you also had that sort of the the romance not really getting any feet for a very long time because she was so focused on it. She didn't want to be distracted by it. And she didn't have mm. time for like, you know, Yanjin's antics. She didn't even notice it. Yeah. Like she didn't even notice <laughs> these two boys kind of like dying for Three her. boys, yeah. And so what you have is this very grounded, very emotionally mature, stable character 
who mm. is always giving as good as she gets. Uh, she doesn't get prissy about things. She's not like precious about herself. She's not like, oh, I have this pot of mud on me. Oh dear. She's very like, she is a gets in she gets as muddy as the boys do. The only times she has problems and from, is, from day one. Yeah, exactly. Like she she's she's it's not like she learns to get muddy. She gets muddy. The moment the, yeah. the first instructor gives the first instruction, she just does it, yeah. no thinking. Yeah, exactly. So she like you said, there is there is no moment where she has to transition from her female character who's just yeah. precious and delicate to <laughs> the male character. Yeah, exactly. So that was really I think that did enough work for me that I in, I was able to enjoy her being fully committed to her male identity, which is one of the things that really annoys me in gender benders. Like it annoys me so much is this constant consciousness of, you know, playing the role, but not just in the way the character is played, but in the way the camera, uh, you know, frames them, the way the camera is looking mm. at them. And like I think the the big the the only concession that they made to um, Shisheng her, her like femaleness was that she had some eyeliner and that you would often have these really lovely shots of like a beautiful lash line and she had a very yeah, beautiful but lash also, line. She had a beautiful lash line and like her profile with with that jawline yeah. and, and those cheekbones. It's really hard to hard to like not be struck yeah by her looks yeah yeah and especially with a haircut somehow this woman I loved became her hair, more beautiful like, yeah like her hair back oh. was the best hair i didn't like it when like it was down it didn't like that was just that's not a hairstyle i ever like but when it was back it always looked good it was brushed back yeah it was, it was yeah just, ah man <laughs> <sighs> so we come to our closing question for a man no, no, no. Hey, do we know? wait. Whoa, whoa. Oh, do you have more to whoa, say? Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. Yes, and I totally forgot what I had a point. <laughs> Hold on. Um, oh, the other aspect of Shi Chang's character is that, I mean, while I, I'm complaining about her not having development and stuff like that, one of the things that I wish they had addressed a bit, but I suppose it was not really possible for them to address in this drama, was um, the hint of... The hint of superiority she seemed to develop towards the like middle to latter half of the drama towards other women in the drama. And I don't see mean super, superiority in like a sneering way, but in more that she had a really close best friend. And this was a best friend that she treated like, hey, you're the girl I must protect. Mm -hmm. In that she like her character started seeing herself as a man who must oh, protect a friend yeah. who's a woman. Yeah. And I, again, I, I emphasize when I use the word superiority, I, I do that with a lot of hesitation because I don't mean like this is a, a, one of those situations where you're thinking of yourself as greater mm -hmm. than the other person. She started thinking of herself as more competent and stronger and better place to protect these women. And, it seemed to me that through dialogue and action, there became a, a distinction between those women and me. She started seeing herself as one of the men, mm -hmm. whereas all of these women in their feminine garbs, those were the women. She started addressing them as those women. They were occasionally sexist jokes that were cracked within the groups and she laughed along. She cracked them herself. I don't remember these this. happened in like, the, because these happened very like, by the way offhand and quickly moved away from it and I was only conscious of them because I was focused on how she was treating her friend which initially it was the two of them like her friend being like all like touchy-feely <laughs> no not just touchy-feely it's just that initially when her fr like she came to I think this is thing this thing is in a town close to Shanghai, uh, mm -hmm. not in Shanghai, but close to it. I've forgotten the name of the town, just like you. Um, but when she first arrived at the town, her friend lives in that town. So her friend protects her secret. And then her friend takes her around town and all of that stuff. So in a way, while she is playing the man, she is accompanying her friend who's, who's again, like holding her arms and this is my friend and taking her everywhere. But her friend is the one who's more competent, more familiar with the environment. Over the course of the story, this dynamic slightly shifts. Her friend is more vulnerable. She is more competent. Like, um, Shi Jung mm -hmm. is more competent. And she has to protect her friend. It's not just that she has to, but that she leaves her friend behind in situations where she thinks that her friend is going to be a liability because 
a friend is a woman and now i'm not saying she's wrong in thinking any of that in these contexts but over time she does this stuff in every social context like even when they are just hanging out she is one of the men those are the women there is a distinction that starts happening and it's never really addressed within the story and the problem with that is because we know very little about Ji Jung we know that she's a wonderful singer there is this one point where she um goes and pretends to be her own sister pretends to be herself <laughs> wears a wig and sings this beautiful song to that rang in my ear for so long um in, in this like theater situation and maybe that was the original you know ji chang's mm, dream yeah. of becoming a singer in theater we don't know it's never addressed mm-hmm. we don't know anything and by the end of her training how does she view that past dream if that was her dream would she be able to readjust to society when she goes back to being a woman because you know eventually that is what would happen in, in this story because she can't just live as a man forever mm. so how we don't have any of those answers which is why i said like this is a bit of a red herring you think the story is going to be about her mm. and you get like these these moments these these developments happening in dynamics and obvious consequences of her training but because the story isn't really about her we don't really see any conclusive change we don't really see any moment any like connecting point from the beginning to the end this is how things go it's it's slightly dissatisfying because you don't know like mm-hmm. the ending doesn't feel like the ending because i don't know much about this girl mm. it's interesting um, it's interesting because i actually didn't view her that way i think even as she identifies herself as part of the group of these boys i don't think it's so much that she saw herself as a male or as one of the boys i think it's more no, that no she can see herself as male mm-hmm. i don't think it was a matter of gender identity yeah, it's l- a matter of finish. power dynamics well, yeah, sorry yeah go on go on the the way i see how she views it is that she sees herself as being as you say competent but she's able to handle herself if she were in a dangerous situation she doesn't need someone to save her whereas with her friend um shao jun it would have been a case of she's vulnerable because she can't defend herself because we do actually have cases of other female characters who can also handle themselves like chumenting and the, the the second female lead and also the character of uh, what's her name uh shianrung who is she's an important character third love interest <laughs> <laughs> one of the best uh, fight scenes of this show actually i thought was the the fight scene between shianrung and chisheng and i, I completely that agree. was such an amazing fight scene beautifully choreographed like we had this show full of men fighting each other but the best scene in it the best fight scene was the one between these two women the, and they were both of them are shown as incredibly competent fighters neither of them underestimates each other and they are both going for the kill it's such a committed fight in so many ways it was excellent absolutely but uh, uh, a point about what you just said about them both going for the kill i think that's one of the reasons the fight scenes were so interesting because you knew that all of these fight scenes were no holds barred mm. every one of them somebody was going to end up getting aside from the ones that are happening within the academy all fight scenes had like live or die mm. stakes and because they had successfully created the uh, environment of of constant danger and and sort of like a reckless you know open season it's it's like a, a, a what's that western uh, you know the wild west terminology that's used it is wild west um, isn't it <laughs> oh that is that yeah. that is the terminology that's used yeah. like it, it's it's the wild wild west it's yeah. it's like you don't know what can happen and and there there is nobody to enforce law so uh yeah the the going for the kill thing but to come back to ji chang yes really good point about the, about that uh dynamic but when you say that she starts seeing herself as competent that's how i initially saw her development of confidence like the stronger she got the better she got at fighting and once she had a mentor um she improved really fast mm-hmm. and and because she was falling behind in in scores compared to like the other cadets in her class and she started getting really really good all of that stuff was really satisfying to watch but if you revisit the drama at some point see how she talks to her not just her friend but other women mm-hmm. 
in the second half of the drama. Okay. She doesn't just protect them. She speaks to them in a slightly patronizing way. She okay. tends to infantilize them a little more. <laughs> and she does it in a voice mm-hmm. of how how men do it. Yeah. And the thing is, if they had addressed it, this would have been a really smart bit of writing mm. because she's living day in and day out with men. Yeah. It's not surprising that, that she that would, like, would adopt their vocabulary. Her. Yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and their perception of the world, mm. where they are the protector and the women need to be protected. Mm. So a bit of infantilizing is natural. Yeah. And I I initially thought this was going to get addressed, which is why I was really impressed. And then it, they just go nowhere with it. <laughs> oh, okay. I will, if, if I do rewatch it, and I might not rewatch the whole thing, but I might revisit parts of it. I'll keep an eye out for that. I do want to mention, though, that one of the things that I think they did really well with the gender bend was that um, so this, this is a thing that other gender benders do constantly all the time and it's infuriating, which is that she'll be competent, right? She will be able to handle herself. But then the guy comes along and suddenly she's a girl and she and can't do better. anything and he has to save her. And she, yeah. you know, she might have been in a uh, military school for like two years, but she can no longer throw a punch. <sighs> God. So, I mean, <laughs> the show doesn't go there. And that no, is no, what is no, very satisfying about how they treat her character is that actually she goes on several sort of rescue missions. Like she rescues herself. Oh, oh my God. Multiple and, and, times. And her friend. You remember yeah, like when her friend gets such, kidnapped yes. and she has to infiltrate. She has to instantly, oh. like she sees this, her friend being kidnapped and she's instantly on it. And she basically is a one woman rescue mission. Yeah. And you have like all of the boys who are in love with her sort of, one, they don't even know she's in trouble. <laughs> Two, by the time they find out, they're like frantically searching and they don't know, like they're crying because they can't save her. And it's like, yes. And also the show doesn't need the hero to overshadow the heroine in mm. order for the romance True. to be valid. And I really liked that. Like they didn't have to cut her down to build Yanjin up or to build uh, Jin Shen Absolutely, up. absolutely. Th- this is why I love this drama. Like, yes. I feel like you <laughs> have been sadly put in a position of defending a drama that I almost forced you to watch because <laughs> I loved it so much and I'm sitting here like criticizing it Oh constantly. no, I don't feel that way at all. I feel like we're... No, no, I, f- I, feel, I feel like that. I feel like... <laughs> The, like there's a pile of dough between us, which is the show, and we're both sort of punching it into shape and kneading it and getting it to be more gluteny. <laughs> and the more we pull it, the more it stretches, you know. And then when we finally make the roti, it's gonna be the fluffiest <laughs> roti ever. Yeah. Exactly. And and now we really should talk about who we said we would talk about at the beginning well, of the drama. The, so I mean, let's let's close the show with with this question, which is, I mean, before we ask the question, I just want to tell everyone that I texted Burma about six or seven episodes in going like how did you know I was going to love this character Didn't just why do you know me what about me made you think and made you say that like I don't understand this tell me why I love Guyanjin so much I have not received a satisfactory answer Borama I await. I, I, I already answered you at the start of the drama. Like, I knew <laughs> that my fixation with Jen was because of something, Eugenides from the Queen Steve series. But Jen is in your no, head. It, but and... but so, it, so is this character. I mean, let's face it. Yes, it's the attire. It's, it's the really sharp haircut. It's the amazing eyes and those thick eyebrows. And oh my God, that tiny mouth and that like perfect nose why am I really objectifying this boy I'm so sorry but like the entire thing like the the cut of his shoulder under the coat of of that military jacket and like the flow of the jacket when he's walking his swagger (laughs) all of that stuff but it all comes together in your head and like punches you and makes you think of a certain type of character Mm. Because it's not just his looks. I mean, as much as... It's not just his his looks. Dude, it's the delivery, his voice, the way he occasionally smiles at exactly the right moment and do that shoulder shake. (laughs) That just... just, uh. And also, just the way they built up his character. Do you know what we're going to do for our listeners? There are are two videos that Burma sent me to watch before I watched (laughs) the show. Which you didn't watch. I didn't because I I said, um, I said right that I'm just going to watch the show. And then I came back to that. Like I was searching for all of the things that I had said in our chat. 
so that I could like bring notes to this to this recording. And then I came across those two videos and I was like, oh, I didn't watch these. And then I watched them and I was like, oh my God, one, Barman knows me too well. She knows exactly what is going to work on me. And two, now I will never know what I would have thought of those before I watched the show. Because you like, would have watched this drama first. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling I was so surprised that I sent you those videos and you didn't immediately start watching this drama. No, no, I immediately watched the show. I didn't watch your videos. That's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, in that case, I'm satisfied. Yes, the work was done right. Uh, so, so, yeah, I mean, that wasn't a very detailed answer. What... What is it about <laughs> this kind of character? Because I know we're not the only people who are just dead for a character like this. But also, this character isn't for everyone. Like, for example, I don't think this is Anissa's kind of character. She'd just be like... No, he, she'll, be, you'll, she'll be annoying. Exactly. <laughs> I can see why you guys might like that kind of thing, but that doesn't work for me. And... Like, I can hear this conversation in my head even as we're not having it. Yeah. <laughs> I We discussed a bit of this um, after you started watching this drama that it's, again, like you said, it's not just about his looks because if they had just stopped with that, that way of dressing him up and that swagger, he wouldn't have had the same impact. Mm. But the way they wrote him, yeah. where he is clever and also... Uh, disillusioned. It's this mix of like confidence and vulnerability, right? And vulnerable. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And he's not afraid to show mm. like his feelings and yeah. directly juxtaposed against him is the male second lead, mm. uh, played by Toby Lee, um, Junction, who's exactly his opposite. Like both of these boys are on the side of right, so to speak, but they are directly night and day opposite. They're both hero types, right? They're both hero types, but exactly the opposite. Exactly. Type. The Junction is the type who's going to be the military commander leading an entire army. And Yanjun is probably the type who's the lone sniper who's going to go and like assassinate people. <laughs> that's that's how I see their character that's interesting. archetypes. See like, yeah, because Junshan is the strong silent type, right? He's the one who is always going to be there to save the day. And actually, interestingly, the beginning half of the drama did give him that role. Like they allowed him to do hero things that you would have thought mm. they'd give to Yanjin to do. But they didn't. Like there's this occasion where Shisheng has... Um, it's a military thing gone wrong, uh, a military exercise mm. gone wrong, and she falls into a trap. Who saves her? Uh, in this moment where she needed to be saved, it wasn't her. Dungeon. Exactly. Not Endgame Loveline. It was this guy. And she ends up spending a night in, in like this yeah, lonely like cottage space. Yeah, like one of these oh. romantic um, relationship building tropes that dramas have. The whole first half of the drama was given it all to Junshan, right? And then when she, find, yeah. when she got like a second love interest, this was like... I don't want to get too deep because we'll we'll get lost in it. But another character who we love, who met her as a girl, totally falls in love with her. And that becomes her second love line. And then you're just like, it's a really long time until you get to the actual endgame relationship. And even then, you actually really don't have a lot of it. And I guess one of the reasons for this is that we learned that um, they cut like at least 90 minutes of content out. Um, and, and, and we will talk about, about, about that cut in a second. I just want to add to what you said. You're right. They didn't get to like the end game romance till about like the final thrust of the drama. Mm -hmm. But the momentum for that end game romance had started pretty early on. Oh, yeah. Because, while... because you're shipping it all the way through. <laughs> oh, oh, absolutely. Like, e even when there's like no romantic interest between them, yeah. the two of them are... They just have such a great they dynamic. They start off as reluctant... Mm. Yeah, they start off as like reluctant partners and then slowly and steadily they become like friends. Well, they start off as enemies. <laughs> like from the moment they Oh my meet. God. They, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. They kind of start <laughs> off as enemies. In that... Nobody can really be friends with Zhang Chen. He's such a spoiled brat. And he thinks of, of making trouble practically the first thing in the morning. <laughs> and you have uh, Zhi Chang's character who just wants to like get through. She She's a good student. She mm -hmm. is pretty much a straight A student, which is why uh, Zhang Chen starts liking her so much. 
because she's a straight A student and he's like, this is a good kid. <laughs> well, I also think that he was responding to something. Um, like, I don't think his like for her was based on like academics. I mean, I'm talking about like the initial liking where, you know, you like this other person who you can see is like a straight A kid. And, and I'm not talking about like the, the, the romantic lighting, which oh. I think for Junction happened somewhat a few episodes. I still later. feel it was more of a personality thing. Like she had this very direct personality. Well, absolutely, it's, no it, nonsense. And direct. it is a direct personality, but that's part of that whole, you know, like straightforward, straight A. Yeah. Like Same I am thing, going right? to wake up at, <laughs> at five a.m. in the morning, and I'll do the runs exactly the number of runs that I was given, even though I'm physically weaker than oh, my comrades. You don't mean academically? And dying. You mean like, okay, I get you. I get you. I get you. Because I don't think he valued her book learning in that way. But if you're talking about her her perseverance oh, no, no, no. I, I, and when i say a good student i'm talking yeah. about a soldier right, okay. i don't think these kids spend more than five seconds on on any really book <laughs> learning in this drama okay yeah um, no, that, i agree with that so and with guyanchan's character with Zhukai's character he is not straightforward at all like <laughs> first of all you don't know what he's thinking his introductory scene is so infuriating because he basically just and this is He's super spoiler at this terrible. point guys we have spoiled everything he basically just just to uh, mess with like there is a family rivalry situation going on and just to mess with the other family he goes into their place of like business i suppose like this is this is a singing hall and kidnaps the singer so to speak and you're like this is reprehensible behavior <laughs> and this is the guy I'm supposed to be like looking at as like the main lead because yeah. he's like on front and center of the poster what is what, why am I going to be rooting for this guy Yeah. and initially you don't see anything redeeming about him because he's not apologetic about his behavior at mm. all but slowly you start seeing that his behavior is almost like the free fall of somebody who stopped caring and mm-hmm. he just does damage to everybody because nothing seems very substantial or real to him. So he's drinking in the middle of the day. He is just utterly uncaring about himself and about the people around him, which is where Shi Chang's personality comes in handy because when they become roommates, she is, again, like I said, very straightforward and a good student. She wants to live up to the expectations of the academy that she's entered. She wants to be a good soldier. Whereas Gu Yanjin is like, I just want to sleep till like, 12 in the afternoon could you just leave me alone and she's like no if you don't perform well that I get punished so you are going to do Mm -hmm. your things and like slowly and steadily her tenacity gets through to him and there is also a bit of kindness in him that initially only comes out for her because he sees how much she's struggling and initially almost carelessly he starts helping her sometimes by playing pranks sometimes by actually doing something you know noticeably kind and like very slowly their camaraderie builds and then okay you know one of the defining moments for his character is when they have like a group of Japanese prisoners in school and all the students hate these people because they had just recently killed Chinese citizens Mm -hmm. and they are like, why are they being held with, like, j- just so carefully? These are assassins, practically. Why are they being just held in our school and nothing is happening? Because the students learn that they are just going to be sent back to Japan. So Jukai and his band of, like, small band of friends decide to play pranks. And then Bailu's character, Ji Chang, is also participating in these. And this is where you see, like, Gu Yun Chen's... Uh, influence on her character where yes she is straight a most of the time but she also finds these pranks justified and she laughs along with the rest of the team while these things are happening it's just like small influences like every time he does something funny and it's going to get them into trouble she can't help but also be pulled along and participate in these things and it's very childish and they don't always think of the consequence but because Gu Yun Zhen has such a you know, he, he has such a magnetic personality. They follow him into these troubles anyway. Mm. And then you have that situation where you have that student come up to Yanjen and be like, you're playing pranks. The, these guys assassinated these innocent people. What, what do you think you're doing? And then things escalate from there as they find out exactly how serious the situation is. And then Yanjen is the one who kind of starts the revolt against like the faculty, Mm. so to speak. 
my point being that his character initially could not give a crap mm-hmm. about anything about the nation about his comrades about his roommate but slowly and steadily as his relationship with you know ji chang improved and they became friends and they started caring about each other he started caring about the other cadets and you can see this full like this this entire arc much later in the drama he fails to save somebody who's really important to the entire group mm-hmm. and that devastates him and you see that in his character i mean i don't think there is another character in this drama that has quite such a dramatic arc mm-hmm. or such a satisfying arc i think one so of so to speak one of the reasons for that is like what you've been describing is that he starts off the drama with a, like no sense of purpose and that's why he does what he does like you know drinking all day and going out all night and all of those things and so what his development over the drama and what he learns over the course of the drama and i don't think it's because of his feelings for shishang i think it's because he himself is he's maturing like he is finding a reason to exist like it's very existential for him like what is the purpose mm. of life he didn't have that at the beginning of the drama but he gains that as the drama goes on and that's... and the mil- and the military academy is i think is what is most instrumental in giving him that purpose i don't mean that mm-hmm. ji chang is the one who gives him that purpose i mean that she is the first friendship that he develops and their camaraderie starts pretty early on but i also think that it's much more internal than that yes there are like these external stimuli and if if we're putting it down to external things i think it's like being exposed to the sort of the life and death nature of what's happening mm. in the world like the experience you know with with the japanese prisoners that was a situation that he hadn't thought deeply about but when he did think about it and when those issues were brought to his attention he was able to actually synthesize that internally and understand it in in a way that he hadn't understood it before and that's how he continues like each new conflict brings new points of thought new um ways of sort of examining his beliefs and gaining new ones and solidifying his values and all of those things um but he also retains the playfulness of his personality and that's what we see Absolutely. him bring the most around Chishang and that's why he's like the sort of the light the lightness that is needed in a group of friends like him and like Jijin they're just like hilarious <laughs> so they're like you know the secondary characters they're just they're so even when they don't get like arcs they're very present and you really feel for them as like you feel like they're your friends and again this is one of the things that makes me compare it a lot to the kel books which is that sense of all of these characters matter all of these people are important to me even if we don't know a lot about like you know the the other friends in the group what we know it's very endearing yeah absolutely oh, there was one thing i wanted to say about the gender bend that i yeah. totally forgot that i just remembered <laughs> so i i guess it's going to be out of order but i'm going to say it now <laughs> you know one of the things i most dislike this is a proper 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 spoiler um as i guess the whole thing is at this point <laughs> but one of the things I really dislike in gender benders is when they make the gender reveal uh sort of the male character viewing the female character in her total nakedness. I just mm. you just don't need that. I I just get really angry about that cuz this is also I'm going to ruin the book series for you guys now as well but I I don't care right now. This is also what they do in the Alana books. is that they have this like magical thing and all of her clothes are burnt off. Oh no, look, she's got ladies bits. I guess we know without a doubt now that she's a woman. Oh, just <laughs> he'd already figured out that she was a woman. He knew it. Why did you have like why do you have to do that? Why do you always have to strip women naked? I just I'm not okay with this. Okay. Oh, I was very not okay oh, with that. And and to come back to Ko Yan Jen, why do we love him so much? So once he figures out his feelings for uh, Shi Chang, even though Shi Chang is like, she doesn't take him seriously for way too long for the amount of effort <laughs> the boy keeps putting in. 
she just keeps thinking he's joking and it just gets like what a woman <laughs> he's not i love how she um, is just so annoyed <laughs> with his attention no no right like i the, i like that too piano because he 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 basically acted like a baby for far too long for him to suddenly see him as like a full grown man yeah. so it's not surprising you did this to yourself i also really like that they finally have her um not ad- acknowledge but realize that she has feelings once they've separated them from the same sleeping space like she had yeah. to leave that room and then she was like beginning to I see him it. yeah yeah i mean part of me was like i want them to have the romance while she's in the same room because then they can be together no, no, absolutely it gets very cute <laughs> uh, but also I, it's not just that just when their sleeping quarters were separated but when he stopped coming into the academy yeah. for a period of time he didn't also, come back he stopped being in the show for ages and i was like where is yes. he he was gone for like oh, 10 I missed episodes him so much yeah. but like it it really did help because you could see her remembering him and missing him and like hearing about him and becoming excited and you could practically see the realization slowly come up <laughs> from like the deep depths of her belly and then into her brain <laughs> it took a while it took a long long time ah uh, and i just want to also say that like um junshan the second lead guy he just when he started his whole courtship thing i mean that whole thing was very funny with just everything but basically like my the person who i always have in mind as like a second lead archetype is shinu from your beautiful um yeah. the role played by young jungkook um me too i think of him every right, single time when i see him he's second, second lead. lead right so junshan yeah. is shinu and like in very like parallel ways so he does that thing that shinu does where he has known the secret for a really long time and instead of being really upfront about it he has fun with it and you're just like i watched that and i was like that's why you're not going to get the girl <laughs> yeah you're, and also like, like he he puts her in a difficult position on for purpose. like no good reason yeah. yeah like for his own entertainment and, and, and he, his own entertainment pretty much he's like ah ha well i'm going to get her to confess to me by like just like putting her in an impossible and situation you're not, where dude you're not that's yeah no. but <laughs> you you know what what else stood out to me goyeon jen was fine with her being a woman and pretending to be a man he never gives it away he protects her secret for yes. like, for he always yeah. protects her secret and he does not mind like for instance when he starts showing his affection towards her and <laughs> he's like i'm done hiding this i'm just going to tell everybody he just goes around <laughs> telling everybody he he makes his he oh, much to her chagrin and everybody thinks that <laughs> ji jung is a man so like he's basically yeah. announcing to the entire academy that he's gay i like men and <laughs> i like men and and he does not care what they think about him and and ji oh. jung is dying of embarrassment he because even, she's like everybody thinks we are gay it's not just that he doesn't mind he plays up to it it's so funny <laughs> it's it's beautiful and and this is where the deleted scenes come in but hold on oh. uh, before that let me just finish making my point he does not care what people think about him and he shows his affection deeply and thoroughly and like he does he, it's like i i don't i don't want to say marking his territory because a part of it is that he wants everybody to know hey that 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 was mine i think mine. he's just so excited but also he's so yeah. he's so he just wants to tell her he wants to tell everybody he's yeah. like deeply in love and cannot hold back whereas Junshan once he like initially when he has feelings for Ji Chang he's like no oh, that's a man i cannot possibly what who am i what am he goes through that whole um mm. what, what do you call, what what is it called like a gay crisis. paranoia oh, I, I, don't I, know. i forget it's, it's, there's there's a there's a term for oh, that I didn't anyway know there was a term. so gay panic i think oh, something okay. there is there is definitely a phrase for this um he goes through that and then he's like oh no oh no she's a woman oh yeah i'm saved but then does nothing with this information that's a super shinu of him <laughs> but was he waits until she is he manipulates her into a position where she is in a woman's garb mm-hmm. like wearing a wig wig and and dress and stuff like that pretending to be her own sister which is slash herself before he flirts with her every time she goes back to wearing uniform he goes back to treating her like a man a comrade he does not want anybody around him thinking that he has feelings for a man junshan will only show his feelings or make any move when she is appropriately a woman 
he also once fi- once he finds out that she's a woman tries to protect her from missions tries to stop her from you know mm, going yeah to, that, to, made to, if he just, <laughs> that made me just made me whereas mad. whereas gu yeonjun is like he respects her she is my girl but like she is badass she can fight her wars. exactly <laughs> she can handle herself like, you you think like, here hold this gun make sure my back is protected while i yeah. like i i shoot like, on he this trusts side her and you can really appreciate how much he d- doesn't just trust her emotionally he trusts her in combat and it's not that yeah, jinshan does. doesn't it's that jinshan i mean by the end of the show that he doesn't it's that he sort of his whole sort of mental how he Makeup. thinks of her has to like yeah. he keeps flipping it around whereas Yanjin is very constant in like he can take her exactly as she is yeah. he wants her his, exactly his, as she his is his world view is far more flexible yes exactly he's able to see her as a woman and, and also a as a competent yeah. warrior yes, yeah exactly and it's it's not a contradiction in right, his head right, so exactly. his, his way of thinking is far more flexible he can cry when he's devastated but he can also go gun down people it's just yeah. like he's not a contradiction but as junshin is just so rigid in the way yes. he holds himself the way he acts but also that makes him do certain hypocritic things yeah. like which we have discussed like we he, there is one instance where he basically tells on guyon chen's yeah. character when he's technically right but also also that man, wasn't cool you have not cool not cool not no, cool he has all. broken broken <laughs> academy's rules too yeah and he has got he has done stuff but like the the moment he remembers all the rules are when his love rival yeah. is the one breaking it it's that was just he's just a bit smug <laughs> i think is the yeah, one word to something up sometimes absolutely yeah and all of that said you still don't stop loving him by the end you love him no you you don't you, don't, yeah. you like junshan because he's he's They are essentially, essentially a, good, a guy. good guy yeah <laughs> yeah exactly james <laughs> <laughs> but to come back to the deleted scenes for a second yeah. because this is interesting i didn't even know there were deleted scenes i just thought i'm i am so used to chinese dramas having very disconnected scene changes sometimes and certain plots going nowhere and certain plots starting from nowhere i just don't question it anymore i just figured hey the uh, yeah but i mean i'm sure like a censor board must have gone through the thing and like cut it up or maybe there were budgetary constraints who knows not questioning it but then Saya watches it and she's like that doesn't quite match so she goes and finds deleted scenes <laughs> i didn't even know there were deleted scenes <laughs> and the deleted scenes make so much sense yeah. because there were certain situations where the thing just didn't go anywhere and i'm like well why was that even a scene yeah because the deleted yeah. scene and the deleted scene okay tell us tell us why it's the scene so what deleted i've been talking for too long <laughs> Um well one of the deleted scenes a lot of I read that a lot of the scenes that were deleted were like relationship moments like kisses and I guess like the one that I watched was between I mean, they weren't even like kiss kisses they were just like what is it lips touching Bex. for a moment <laughs> yeah um but yeah so this was uh like a bathroom scene where Guyanjin kisses Shishang and like all of the other boys see or a bunch of the other boys see and it's so it's like a a, a faux gay kiss so i guess that's the reason that it was cut out but also it wasn't a gay kiss so you're kind of like hmm <laughs> yeah but but I, i suppose with scenes like that and even with all of those scenes cut out there was enough material in the show that the show itself yeah. was basically um how, like the academy was oddly not homophobic mm-hmm. in that everybody was wary and everybody was like oh i think a lot of them yeah, were like they shipping are. they were properly shipping them it was hilarious yeah yeah exactly <laughs> like they, 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 there was a, like support there were people rooting for these like oh, God and I was like, this is a very modern <laughs> like way modern than we are in this day and age it's so funny this is yeah this is a nice space but um, you know i think this is this is also like it's very characteristic of male spaces kind of thing and i guess because we're used to i don't know about you but i'm used to this kind of you know the white eurocentric men don't touch men don't cry men you know that sort of mm. men must be manly all the time and manly means being stoic and unemotional for like ever except like the only way you can show emotion is by punching something so like that is a thing but like for like i'm sort of eastern cultures i guess and i don't 
I'm not. I, I'm going to generalize a little. No, I mean, for instance, in India. Yeah, like uh, certainly for South it, Asians, it, it's, it's perfectly okay for men to hold hands while they're walking yeah, down the and street. It's not a thing. And it's not because they're yeah. It's it's not because mm. they are gay or they're declaring to the world that they're gay. Friends do it. Yeah, they they we they men hug each other and constantly. men can love each other very much without it being yeah. uh, this sort of big occasion of you know everybody's gay and it's just like some people are and some people are just like very physically the, the 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 phobia of hey you're touching me are you gay mm. is not quite there and i'm not sure i'm not saying that that is necessarily a superior society it's often a society where the consciousness of uh homosexuality is actually a yes. little less yeah that's so totally true. in a heterosexual society where the consciousness of the existence of homosexual people is less mm. it it makes men more comfortable to just like yeah. show affection physically yeah, exactly. and and again like i'm saying this is not necessarily a good thing this is in in terms it's just of a thing. like social progression <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just a thing because i again i don't think like western societies had that you know bro hug hand holding thing yeah. ever at least not at least not how i have seen <laughs> western history play out on television if that was a thing please let me know <laughs> I I wouldn't know. But I I guess <laughs> what I'm saying is that the idea that they would find that hilarious and sort of semi support it is also is quite natural. I mean they were a little weird about it but also yeah, yeah they they were like yeah I mean I suppose that this is this is you, you, yes, you, you guys you can have you your love. thing. It's a little odd. Yeah, exactly. The rest of us will yeah. be a little like that's not yeah, my thing yeah. but like oh they also had that uh, secret garden, you know, a push oh, up yeah. kiss. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that was cut out too. Yeah. Oh, damn it. That was so that funny was because, like, they that was very early in the drama. And, like, yeah. you know, Yanjin is taken by surprise himself. And he, I think that was before he knew she was a girl. And he was like, oh. Did I just have a kiss with like my colleague? <laughs> it's just like weirded out by it, and but also still very open about it. So that's I think one of the most yeah, he, he appealing was, things about I, him is that he's very take it as it comes. He, he kind does of person. not. He yeah. does not care. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's been more than two hours. I guess we should kind of think about. I, I know. This. I have been. I have been. Che- I have been checking. But you know, the thing is that we have so much to say about this. I don't there is think a lot to say. it would have been possible to yeah. stick to our original. <laughs> well, I, we stuck limit. to our plan at least, even if not by the time. Because you were smart enough to have a plan. <laughs> well, otherwise, I wouldn't have known what I was saying for most of it. I I guess we can leave it here. And yeah. Oh, uh, one useful thing to know possibly is that you can depending on your geo restrictions you can actually watch the whole series on youtube on the IG channel um it's on the IG app um it's also on viki so it's very easy to watch um you know the thing i really like about c dramas is that firstly like they're about 40 minutes in terms of like episode length and like six or seven of those minutes are credits <laughs> They're very watchable. And the other thing I realized yeah. is that C-dramas don't do like cliffhanger endings in the way that... See, they at, just cut a scene in half. Literally, they will just like <laughs> not finish the scene. They will stop it in the middle of a scene and you're like, that was the middle of a scene. I need to watch the rest of the scene so you start the next episode. And like it took me ages to notice this. Oh, how? Like I was like, what? oh, cliffhanger endings. Because I was thinking, oh, that's a good cliffhanger ending. And then I was like, hold on, that's not a cliffhanger ending. That is an incomplete scene. Because sometimes a scene will just begin, one character <laughs> will start saying something and, and the scene will end. Yeah, you're like, <laughs> of course I have to watch the next episode. I need to know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> right it's like the smartest oh. thing ever and and you know that they aren't like doing it on a you know hey uh, you are getting two episodes this week so you know you get half of it this day and no not because they're like every, every day single episode yeah. it, it is just ends at just random points yeah <laughs> i i think that really uh. is sort of you've gamed the system of episode endings there you know like the yeah, the, yeah. the gasp moments that you have to have at every break you you've figured it out like you don't need cliffhangers. Just stop in the middle of the scene. Absolutely. And we're good. So before we end, I just want to say two things. First, the secondary female lead. Oh, um, she's so good. Who, Sorry. So yeah, played by actress uh, Wu Jiayi. Uh, she, 
Zhu Manting is just such a boss uh, <laughs> for like 90% of the drama. Yeah. For 10% of the drama, she like, okay, maybe for like 30% of the drama, she pines a bit uh, for uh, yeah. Zhu Kai's character. It's a short stretch where she's which, which is Which is very annoying because he's very clear about his rejection. And she's like, I will keep on pining. <laughs> and that that gets really annoying for a bit. But before she gets to pining stage, she is the best. She is so amazing. Like... <laughs> I mean, she is confident and she is clever and she rescues these idiots more than a few times. <laughs> yeah. And she also at one point ends up like, you know, remember uh, Jun Shan's elder brother who seemed like a mob boss to yeah. us? At the beginning, we told you. Yeah, so he is massively in love with this woman. They are basically childhood sweethearts, but she grew up and was like, you are forcing me to marry you, so I don't like you anymore. So <laughs> he was amazing about giving her space. So, that was one thing. Their so relationship was done. so respectful. Yeah. Yeah, and which is why their ending was just, I, I, loved, I loved it, it so much. Yeah. <laughs> and at one point, this guy is just, he is in massive trouble. And she just marshals her forces, goes and rescues him. Yeah. And it's just, and she doesn't even do it because she's in love with him. She does it because they've been friends forever. Mm. And she will rescue her people. Of course, he is her people. Yeah. And it's just, she is such a bomb. She's, she's yeah. just, she's absolutely yeah, perfect. I really, I really liked how the show centered friendship as a motive for helping people like oh yeah you know like how she spends a lot of the show being in love with Yanjin and like Yanjin always turns up like he always shows up for her but he makes yeah. it clear that it's because you're my friend we are friends yeah, so if you ever need anything call me like I will help you but I am yeah. I am, can't be your lover I'm not in love with you also that was such an amazing just- scene <laughs> That, that is perfectly, yeah. that, absolutely. Because he very clearly has affection for her, but only as a yeah. friend. But also, can we just, again, like I said, she keeps rescuing these idiots. She <laughs> rescues Young Jen yes. from like a forced marriage situation <laughs> where she kidnaps oh. the groom <laughs> on a motorbike. That's hilarious. Oh my God. So good. Um, yeah. Look, I, I need her, like this character, not just this actress, this character to be the main lead of a yeah. drama. I, I, I just I like mean, I in wanted a way Veronica she Park is. to be the main lead of her own <laughs> drama. So, but it's, this is sort of what a drama this big can do, right? Like with all of those episodes, it can center particular characters in their stories for, mm. you know, those periods of the story. So I, I wouldn't call her a, a supporting character as such. She has, no, no, she, she's, um, she's built yeah, as a main lead. Right. And also she has, she has like a proper character arc. Like she is an actress who is really popular, actress and a singer, who's really popular. And then she, her popularity tanks because of certain reasons. Mm. And then she sort of like practically claws her way back mm. again. And like, it's such, it's so satisfying to watch. And she's a woman of independent means. So it's like, you yeah. know, a different type of female strength, right? And I hate to use yeah. like a cliched kind of terminology like that. But, you know, they showcased different types of characters in really interesting ways that were very enjoyable. Absolutely. And even like, if we can spend one moment on Xianrong, who, ah. one of the things I expected from her, again, super spoiler, super, super spoiler, is that she was in love with Junshen. Junshen rejects her w- mm. with a really amazing speech, by the way, because they're on different sides of the war. You know, she's Japanese and he's Chinese and they are fighting for different things. And I Mm. expected her love for him to turn to hatred. That's a very tip. Like, that's what you would expect, right? You don't want me. You've rejected me. Okay, I'll make you suffer. But she doesn't. To the almost absolute end, she cannot hurt him. And, you know, I mean, the ending was the ending. But like, that was, I thought that was a really interesting choice. And not one we often see characters being given. I agree. And I also really like that there were characters who were in a morally gray space. And often these people were Chinese. Like, for instance, the Chinese imperial family. You had a, a wing of the Chinese imperial family trying to win back power. And these people, while they were shown sympathetic and in like... You know, this this kind of like a, a laid back splendor, kind of like constantly dreaming of what they used to be <laughs> yeah. and everybody like they they still have a court, yeah. for instance. And it's like, it, it's just like you can see that they have stagnated in a space where they are like they are yearning for the bygone years and nobody else is yearning, just yeah. them <laughs> and, and their immediate court years. Yeah. And the thing is, in a way, it's that family is tragic. And, but they have also meted out injustices. Mm. And 
this character of Jian Rong, she was one of the people who suffered injustice at the hands of that family. Mm -hmm. So when she comes back and she is like, vengeance will be mine, you kind of can't fault her for like her way of thinking. Yes, she is, you know, Japanese now. She's on that side. Yes, and the Japanese have been painted as bad, bad, all bad. But she comes in with a nuanced motive and you're almost like, yeah, let this girl have like mm. half a vengeance. <laughs> yeah. Because, <laughs> yes, she's a bit insane, but like, <laughs> cool point. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, but also like her relationship with this family is also not very straightforward. It's not just hatred. Mm. She has hatred for a specific part of the family, but also a mixture of love mm. and... Resentment. And it's like, very fraught. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very fraught. So there are some epic scenes with like her and like this family, for mm. instance. It just, like you said, 19 different plots. Yeah. Like 18 <laughs> of them are fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and finally, the music. The, the moment the intro music started, I always listened through the mm-hmm. entire... I, could, I couldn't help it. Like, what was it? 48 episodes? I listened to every single episode, like the, the intro of every... Oh, that's because interesting because I actually skipped it for about... A- maybe 25, 30 episodes. And I was like, I actually really like this. I'm going to watch it now. And then I'd savor it. Right? It was something about the way it just really put you in, in the mood. And the mood. art was amazing. The, mu- and the, the music oh and my the God. art. Both of them were just like, it's so good. I was playing it in my room. Like maybe I was watching the last episode or something. I was playing it out loud. My sister calls out from yeah. the other room. I really like the credits. I was like, yeah, me too. Right? Our rooms are next to each other. So we yell at each other through the yeah. doors. <laughs> I was like, oh, I didn't realize you were listening. But yeah, it was it was so good. I don't even know how they make that. It it sounds like there are these metal doors being shut, like at the at the start of the song, and then there are guns being blasted. But none of those things are actually being used. No, I don't know how they got that effect, but it felt like a song that told a story of war, but also a- about cool people in leathers and like <laughs> <laughs> yes, mainly cool people in leathers. <laughs> okay seriously we have to leave it there let us leave you with that okay, image okay, yeah. <laughs> and where can people find us on the internet once you have watched the arsenal military academy come and talk, come to, and us. talk to us <laughs> on twitter you can find dramas over flowers at dramas overflow and uh you can find me Parama at festa faster you can find me saya at not now saya you can also find the podcast on Instagram at dramasoverflowers underscore. You can email us at dramasoverflowers at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook um, and you can come to our website, the dramasoverflowers.net. We've been posting like first impressions and like just random stuff about dramas there. And um, come check that out. And um, you can sign up to our newsletter if you want. The link is down below. You should also... Go and check out Borma's newly revived Tumblr where she's been posting her drama thoughts. Where is that, P? Ah, um, yeah, you can do that. <laughs> yeah, the username for that is at the drama notes. If you're on Tumblr, come and tell me and I'll I'll, 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 I'll like chat with you there because it, it's fun. <laughs> Tumblr is weirdly, it, it's starting to become like one of my favorite social spaces right now. And I'm trying to convince these two to come and join me, but they are like... Um, one more social platform. <laughs> <laughs> One too many. And Dramas Over Flowers is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. I did it right this time. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> and that's it, everyone. Thank you for sitting through. I don't know how many, how long this will be in the cup, but it's probably <laughs> minimum two hours. Right now, we're at two and a half hours. So... <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> I hope I hope you enjoyed it, everyone. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening and um take a nap after this. I'm sure it was exhausting. <laughs> take a nap but put Arsenal Academy on first. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Do that. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye guys. <laughs>